slides and Ramil for hooking me up with an excellent microphone. It seems to be working well. So thank you and congratulations on what's well, really a you know pretty exciting uh, day here. <clears throat> now Nira mentioned in the very beginning how nervous the speakers are, and I have to say, in alumnus here, I didn't realize how nervous I was going to be until I actually got here, and I just and I I uncovered something. It's a, called a postgraduate residual stress syndrome. <laughs> I, I didn't even know it existed, but uh, hopefully we'll get it out there today and we'll be viral by this afternoon and we'll have a new word we can put in Wikipedia. <laughs> but, you know, I, last time I was in this room, I took a final, a government course, 30 years ago, and that's the name post-residual stress syndrome. <laughs> so, I got that uh, off my off my desk. There are some people that are with me today that really aren't, but I want to introduce them to you. That is me in a suit, which I don't own anymore. Uh, and that is the NASDAQ bell ringing. You, know, you ever hear that ringing the bell You know when you take your company public? Well, this was our first company, Power Medical Interventions, and we took it public. And this is my 12-year-old daughter, Jessie. This is my wife, Linda, class of 83, my alert engineer. My son Chris is here, he's a senior right now. Back here is my daughter Catherine, she graduated last year. So Lafayette was well, well represented at uh, yeah, NASDAQ for me, at least this day, and many other days. A lot of your uh, uh, classmates and colleagues have done this and continue to do this, and the education you receive here certainly prepares you well uh, for uh, uh, moving on to doing what you want to do. And that's really kind of the topic of my story today. Uh, what can you do? Uh, in a global economy, and all these great tools that we've seen examples of today, you know, from the internet to Skype to just all the communications, Facebook, etc. Yeah, I'm not going to repeat what you know better than I do. But uh, today's reality is you can organize a global medical device company in less than a year. And that is a really kind of a dramatic uh, comment. If you think about my perspective, I started in this industry 30 years ago, right out of Lafayette, I went to work for a small company called Johnson & Johnson, right? Okay, so you may have heard of them. Okay, but the, uh, I, I worked on a lot of interesting things like the coronary stent. Who's heard of the coronary stent? Well, it goes in for cardiac disease. Well, when I was here, people's chest got cracked open. And they took a vein in your leg and put it in your chest. That's how you got took care of coronary artery disease. Well, by 1988, we were testing these little tiny little metal stents in hearts, right? And next thing you know, you talk about disruptive technology. It's not just happening in IoT and in information systems or in on the internet. It's happening everywhere, right? So coronary stents are commonplace today. Drug eluding stents, you've heard. Well. That entity in 1988 took us probably 12 years to organize and get going, and a little, little under $200 million. Okay, that's kind of, uh, with the speed of information moving, there's also speed of capital markets responding to new entities. And this is a, what I really want to talk about. If, if we can do it, and it is a reality, I'm going to prove it to you because we're doing another one right now, and that's what Nero asked me to, to speak to you about. The Microinterventional Devices is our new company. And I just thought through what we're doing, show you what we're doing, and give you an idea of, of how we're doing it, and how the new realities of today's global economy and communication allows us to do it this way. So first of all, we analyze the opportunity. Well, I guess I can look here. It's supposed to be like a newscaster. Analyze the opportunity. <laughs> Organize around, around a compelling vision. Uh, communicate, communicate, communicate. And there's one point I want to really make. When you take uh, full advantage of the, the, you know, the global worldwide net and other media outlets, you really you can communicate in a way instantaneously that you could never have possibly done in 1982. I think this was made, Chris made that, this comment and highlighted that very well in his opening uh, presentation. So, uh, actually, I just I want to give my daughter Catherine a, a little uh, advertising. She works for us in microinterventional marketing communications. And our website is uh, microinterventional.com, so you can go there if you'd like and see a little more detail what I'm telling you this morning and see what we're doing. But that was done from scratch in less than you know, two months. This gives you an idea. And the, the dollars that it costs, that type of advertising would have cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars. I think we did it for like 3,000. Just to give you a you know, sense of scale and, and, and size here. And communicate in the sense of a global company means a lot more than speaking to a group or talking, you know, English, speaking English. 
In our last company, Power Medical, we had 280 employees. We spoke seven languages, uh, and we were operating on three continents. I'm, I'm going to show you a little more of that as we go through. But uh, as far as cultural and gender diversity, if you haven't figured that out that by now, you better get it figured out real quick. Because the world, as was also pointed out in the earlier presentation, is a dynamic and changing place. Okay? The man that says this cannot be done should not interrupt the man doing it. Right? Steve Jobs has another uh, rendition of this. Uh, I forget exactly, I don't want to try to quote him, but you know, the, the people that think they can change the world are the people that change the world. If you don't think you can, you're already sunk. So believe in yourself, and in one of the definitions, again, back to Chris's comments earlier, about you know, we, the collective we, and we're part of it, we are part of the global world. You, you might as well move already into that definition and get yourself in that mindset, because it's a fact. And once you get yourself oriented towards that, then you can start saying, well, what's my purpose? You know, I'm more, you know, what, this is what Steve Jobs was saying, find what your passion is. It doesn't matter what it is. We saw what Brian's was in Trenton, New Jersey. That's it. Just, that's, just do it. And do it better than anybody else. Okay? So, uh, analyzing the opportunity. Has anyone heard of Francis Fukuyama? The professors aren't allowed to answer. That's not fair. <laughs> He's at, he's at Hopkins, and he wrote this book, The History of the Last Man. It's a little dated now because of global changes. But back, I forget what year it was published, but when it, when it came out, he really it was a, the concept of you know, liberal democracies and free market enterprises. Now, we have this to varying degrees around, uh, around the world, and as you operate a company globally, and you are the principal of that company, you learn local custom and local monetary policy and local regulation very quickly or you're not very successful, especially in the medical device field, because it's a regulated field, right? We're not going around just putting things in people's body. They have to be proven and tested, and then biocompatibility, and well, I'm not even going to go into that since I'm not I waste my time just giving that list, but uh, each uh, geographic region has different variations on the thing. They're, they're becoming more standardized, but there, there, there are differences. But what really allows us to, and this is just amazing, you know, concept where, you know, even in, in my lifetime, the the, uh, the amount of liberal democracies were a minority, and you know, the, you, you see as as time has gone on, the uh, it's becoming a much more predominant uh, political social uh, uh, organization for countries, and that's basically what what uh, Fukuyama was saying that you can't judge history in the way we used to. We went you know from a dictatorship to a hierarchy to a parliament to a democracy. These changes that occur that are kind of inflection points may not happen ever again because there seems to be a choice here with these liberal, uh, uh, liberal democracies. This coupled with the communication vehicles that we talked about that exist that uh, you all know way better than the people in my generation do make this a global economy. And these two conditions are what I believe uh, set you up for a really exciting you know, career uh, as you go forward. Once you choose your vision, and you understand the dynamics that are happening internationally, and communications available to you. It's just so exciting. I can't even, I just get like goosebumps thinking about it. <laughs> let's, let's go into it a little bit more, because this is our current opportunity. And I, I thought that the slides that Chris used about the rapidity with which the internet's growing and the hits on Facebook are growing, you know, it, it's, it's, it really is mind boggling. Maybe you all take it for granted, but I certainly. From an economic operation standpoint, when you look at those numbers, you look at available, what we would call an available market to us, these numbers, this is real. This is, an act, this is the business I'm in right now. In 2010, it was less than $500 million. Right? By 2015, it will be a $2 billion market. And the only reason it's not going faster is because it's a regulated business. And you have to go through the regulatory gates. But this is about as slow enough to make you see anymore. And I mean, it's, you're talking three years, right? That's, that's slow by the consumer electronics term, term, uh, mentality, I guess. But our business is, is a lightning, lightning fast. So this is our opportunity. Transcatheter aortic valve insertions. OK, today, I'm going to give you a choice, OK? A or B. A, you get to get your chest cracked open. We stick a couple cannulas in your heart. Run your butt out to the machine where we re-oxygenate it and pump it back in. Operate on your heart for a couple hours. 
So you back up, get your sternum back together, pull the cannula out, hopefully all the blood's back in. And also no cheating horses. <laughs> the uh, and uh, you get to go home, that's A. Or B, you put a little incision through your ribs and work on your beating part, you go home the same day. Who wants A? Uh, that's okay, you got one. Who wants B? Yeah, that's bigger. Okay, so you, you see, but we're obviously, that, that is something we are really passionate about. It's easy to get behind that because people, nobody wants to see their themselves, <laughs> their family members, their aunts, uncles, grandparents in pain or having this difficult recovery. No, who would want that, right? Many of you have probably already seen it. So analyze the opportunity. We have a good opportunity here in you know, Trans April. Oh, and by the way, this is our instrument. Looks like a little, uh, a little hand gun, but this gun, and you're going to see an anatomy show, I'll get too much into it. It goes through the ribs and actually creates a, a, a access way to your heart so you can operate. And, and the last company in this one, based on my own intellectual property that I developed in my basement. So these is a, this isn't like you're talking to somebody who hasn't done this. I've done this, I'm doing it again. And the people I do it with are very experienced people because we really care about these patients. And this is really easy to get behind that. Okay, so that's the vision that we have. Then you have to have some skills. Uh, does anyone remember Peter Drucker? He's passed away now. God rest his soul. But a uh, great management consultant did a lot of, uh, he was a uh, contemporary of Deming, who, was, uh, who wrote a lot about quality, especially in Japan in the uh, 70s and 80s. It's famous work. You should get the opportunity to go back and look at it if you're interested in business. But uh, he talks specifically about things that you would need. This is, this is actually a, a treaty of about four uh, or five um, articles, and it's really a good read. It's a little dated again. It's about eight years old, and you know, things change so rapidly. But there's some really good premises, like provide vision and resources, hope and purpose to the organization. Right? That, that is really important. If you're going to start your own organization, get it clear in your own head, know what your own passions are, and then make sure everybody else you come in contact, like I'm doing with you, knows how important this is to you. It starts right there. And I would say the best way to participate is by doing. You can analyze things until, you know, forever, because it's so changing and it's so fascinating. And maybe that is your point, to analyze the markets like that CD pipeline did. So that, that is a job. So that itself becomes a passion. So if you find that, you, you know, point, your string, that's what, that's what you do. Turn the traditional hierarchy pyramid upside down. When, when I, I grew up, I said I joined Johnson & Johnson, 240,000 employees, founded by a general from the Army. So you want to talk about hierarchy, anybody in ROTC, you know what hierarchy is, right? The captain, the lieutenant, you know, you know that, right? That's hierarchy. And that's why they were so famous and so well organized and did so well through the 1800s and 1900s. With the lack of the communication vehicles that we have today, required a chain of command. And that chain of command had to be disciplined. But that's gone now. Playing field's flat. You've seen the book, The World is Flat. Well, it's flat. Okay? Build a culture based on principles in a turbulent world. While things are going to change around, us, stick to your core values and stick to who you are and what you want, how you want to live your life as an example for others. Okay, and communication is the underlying and unifying force. Tell me not forget, show me I may remember, and involve me, and I'll understand. Okay? Here's micro-interventional uh, devices. Convert open surgery to minimally invasive surgery. No sternotomy, no cracking the chest. No cardiopulmonary bypass, we're not pumping your blood out of your body. You get to keep your own blood. Benefit, shorter hospital stay, and less pain. Okay, that's our company. And I, I just have a quick two minute video to show you. Um, did you have to click it for me? To show you what it is instead of me talking about it. I think you just click on it, it went a little work for us. Did you hear the one about the. <laughs> The first step in percutaneous transcatheter structural heart repair procedure is the deployment of MID's permaseal access and closure technology to create a self-sealing access site into the heart. 
The proprietary anchors of the perma-sealed device have been developed to create a secure attachment to the epicardial surface of the heart. The anchors have a unique design incorporating a solid core with one flexible barb. The barb hugs the solid core during deployment to enable myocardial penetration, but bites into the tissue to resist retraction and ensure that the anchors cannot back out. An operative window is created by the unique and proprietary elastic V-stays of the perma-seal device. The V-stays connect the six polymer anchors, creating the access point during the intervention and closing the access puncture after the procedure has been completed. Due to their elasticity, the V-stays expand and contract as the surgeon or interventionalist passes the catheters through the operative window. A guide wire is first introduced through a needle inserted at the access site, typically located near the apex of the left ventricle of the heart. The perma-seal delivery device is fed over the guide wire to the epicardial surface at the access site. When the device is fired, the anchors penetrate the pericardium and myocardium of the heart, anchoring the V-stays to the surface of the heart. The perma-seal device is then removed over the wire. The sheath, allowing access to the left ventricle of the heart, is fed over the wire and through the operative window of the perma-seal access enclosure implant. Passage of the sheath through the operative window expands the perma-seal V-stays and allows access to the ventricle via the transapical access site. The sheath is inserted into the heart from below, providing a conduit to allow passage of intraoperative instrumentation to carry out various steps in a given procedure. Once the procedure is completed, the sheath can be removed. As the sheath and guide wire are removed from the heart, they pass back through the operative window of the perma-seal device. Yeah, you know, we, we invented that. You know, it didn't, it doesn't exist, didn't exist, right? A group of us got together and said, how are we going to solve this? And we were passionate about it, and we did it. We didn't ask could we or should we or how to we. I mean, we did We just did it. And uh, if you met the, the staff, you'd find that they have that same inquisitive, uh, you know, a youthful and uh, nature that they had when they were 18 and they're in their 50s and 60s. They haven't changed. They, you know, they've kept that mentality of, Anything's possible. If you can dream it and believe it, you can do it. Okay? So we're, we'll be, we're coming up on two years, so I want to just be accurate about this, but, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm going back to you, uh, but uh, we have offices in Langhorne, Pennsylvania, which is just about an hour and 20 minutes south of here. Um, and, you know, as a little uh, nod to uh, Brian Hendrickson, uh, whoops, I'd uh, like to point out that this facility is in Langhorne, which is 10 minutes from Trenton. And he was encouraging us to build Trenton, build Trenton and the world will make it. Well, we're 10 minutes away, so yeah, we maybe we heard him. <laughs> so uh, we're happy to, you know, this is a clean room, it's environmentally controlled. It can support $100 million in annual revenue. We have an office in Toulouse, Hamburg, and Tokyo. And this is less than a year and a half. And the product's going to be done in Germany in um, uh, clinical trials in approximately uh, uh, three weeks. We're going to start a human trial, so. That's all been organized and split, you know, in the wink of an eye, it, on our time, <laughs> timeline. So you're not going to sound like a lot to you, but in the blink of an eye to us. But uh, you, you may have heard the famous uh, graduation uh, commencement speech by Steve Jobs at Stanford University. And he, he, he closed with a little quote from the back of the whole birth catalog. Does anybody remember the whole birth catalog? Some people. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> um, that's part of that uh, postgraduate stress syndrome. <laughs> but uh, stay young, stay foolish, right? Imagination is more important than knowledge, Albert Einstein. And the journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step, so you may as well get to it. Thank you all very much for your time today.